Good morning, good morning. Welcome to the square. Hi to those at home online. We are so grateful that you are here. I know we've kind of got a tight turnaround today, so some of us are making our way in. But in the meantime, would y'all please stand with me so that I can pray and we can center our hearts, posture our hearts towards Jesus, the one in whom we are here to, to worship and give our time and our attention to. Lord Jesus, we just say thank you so much for who you are. Thank you for the gift of knowing you. Thank you for the proximity of your presence. Thank you for the gathering of believers here in this house. Jesus, we thank you that every time we fill this room, that you fill it even more with your spirit. Jesus, we are hungry. We are hungry to meet with you. We are hungry to bring you an offering of praise that you are worthy of. We give you our time. We give you our attention. We turn our eyes toward you. Would you recaptivate us today? Refascinate us today with your beauty, Jesus, that we would see you rightly and sing songs of love to you that you are worthy of. We love you, Jesus. All glory and honor and power and praise belongs to you. Would you receive our worship as an act of love this morning? We love you, Jesus. Have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship King Jesus together this morning. The wages of my sin was death. Hell down 
together, every voice, let's declare. And death couldn't hold you down, hell couldn't steal your crown. There's resurrection power in your name, in your name. And let all the earth cry out, lift up a holy sound. Consider all is lost compared to knowing you, God. I stand before you, all by majesty. Covered by your mercy. Blood has made me free. Draw me to you. You set my heart on fire. We declare this out. I want to know. I want to know you. You're my. lover of my soul yes you are 
know you. This is not a passive prayer. This is active worship. This is an active request. I want to be filled with your presence, utterly and totally consumed by you, Jesus. Oh, I'm not going to hold back when I'm asking for more of you. Let's declare this together, church. I want to know you. Let your spirit overwhelm me. Let your presence overtake my heart. Oh, we sing, I want to know. Show me. 
your face that we would become fully consumed by who you are lost in your beauty caught up in your splendor there's nobody like you Lord Jesus this week my husband and I were having a conversation he's just in this really sweet sweet time with Jesus and every day God is just revealing something new and Braden just wakes up and he's like already eyes locked on Jesus and he looked at me a couple days ago because our morning was crazy and he's like I'm feeling anxious like why am I feeling anxious and then he looked at me and he said it's crazy what happens if you look away from Jesus for just a moment for just a moment everything becomes a little bit more chaotic it becomes a little more nerve-wracking but if you just look back at Jesus things come back into alignment. Chaos comes back into order. Anxiety comes back into peace. Fear comes back into hope. Sorrow comes back into to joy. We can make it to the end. Whatever you're going through, you can make it to the end. If you just look at Jesus, if you just allow Jesus to be your central focal point, he has all that you need. And that is not a quippy saying that we have. It is a conviction that this house lives by. So Jesus, captivate us again. Keep us locked in your gaze. Set our gaze upon you, Jesus. Teach us the discipline of fascination. Teach us the discipline of locking eyes with you. Lord, we love you with all of our hearts, with all our soul, everything we have, everything we own, you can have it all. We love you, Jesus. It's in your holy, perfect name we pray these things. And God's people said, amen. Amen. Church, as a continuation of our worship, each Sunday, our church has a liturgy that we recite out loud together that puts language to what the square believes to be God's heart for generosity and the giving of our tithes and offerings as an act of worship unto Jesus. Would you look to the screen and read these words out loud with me? Holy Father, you are a faithful provider. There is nothing I have that you have not given me. All I have and am belong to you, bought with the blood of Jesus. To keep everything to myself and to give without sacrifice, to build my kingdom is the way of the world that you cannot abide in. But generosity is the way of those who call Christ their Lord, who love him with freed hearts, who serve him with renewed minds, who withstand the delusion of riches, whose hearts are in your kingdom and not in the systems of the world. I am determined to increase in generosity until it can be said that there is no need among us. I am determined to be trustworthy with such a little thing as money that you may trust me with true riches. Above all, I am determined to be generous because you, Father, are generous. It is the delight of your daughters and sons to share your traits and to show you to the world. Amen. Amen, church. You all can take a seat. Well, good morning, church. Uh, it's so good to be with you. And if you are new with us this morning, uh, I'm, my name is Phil. I have the privilege of being the lead pastor here at The Square. And uh, today I want to take time. We're going to pray for Pastor Sean and Christina Bentley, who are stepping into a season of sabbatical for the next 10 weeks. They're going to take time and they're going to rest and they're going to be allowed to, to release pastoral duties for a moment and just have a, a, a season of the rest and the leadership of God. 
And if you've been part of our church family for a while, you know that this is a, a normal thing. This is part of our uh, beliefs and structures around what it means to just provide health and leadership for our pastoral team. Uh, two years ago, I went on a sabbatical. A season before that, Pastor Lindsay went on a sabbatical. It's a normal part of our culture. And I say that because I recognize that not everybody uses the word sabbatical in the same way. And for other communities or other situations, maybe at times it feels like it's a bit of a, a cover-up statement for other stories or other situations or other things going on. And that's just not who we are or how we operate. If there's ever difficult situations happening, we'll just be very transparent. Uh, we, uh, we believe that sabbatical is an intentional season. Pastor Sean has not only led here for a significant amount of years, um, nearly 25 years of pastoral ministry without a season of rest. And it is an incredible joy for us that we get to come alongside of them. And we today just want to pray for them and bless them and allow them and release them into this next season. Will you guys welcome up Pastor Sean and Christina Bentley? Uh, you guys know just such a beloved couple in our church, on our staff, and uh, we, we want to just pray over them. Before I do that, I just wanted to ask if you would just share how, how we, over these next 10 weeks, can be praying with you and praying alongside of you in this season. Thanks, Phil. I just want to begin by just thanking you and uh, our church council and uh, the square for providing this incredible gift to us. It, it, this really is a generous gift that you are giving to me and, and to my family. Uh, and we receive it with a lot of gratitude and are actually really excited and looking forward to the next 10 weeks. Uh, one simple way that you can pray uh, for me actually comes from uh, Psalm 27, verse 4. There, David uh, prays that, uh, that or asks the, the Lord to help him just behold his beauty. And uh, in the midst of busyness and doing a lot of things, it's, it's hard to have time just to stop and behold what the Lord is doing around you. And so I honestly feel like the next 10 weeks is an opportunity uh, just to simply behold the work of God in my own life and in my family and in my future. And so uh, just if, yeah, we pray that you would just help my heart to behold the beauty of the Lord. That would mean a lot to me. Yeah, I love it. I really do in invite you over these next uh, you know, two and a half months, just be prayer for Sean and Christina that, that as God leads them into the season and of course leads them into the next season of leadership and our church and their future, that there would just be such a, a life and a restored love and heart that, that, the, that, that God would really meet them in a powerful way. And I know from when I was on sabbatical, it actually means more than you know when you get a little loving encouragement from people you care about. You're like, oh, I was gone and I don't, did anyone care? Did anyone care? And then it's, uh, you know, just the human heart when you take seasons like this. But church, will you just pray with me? Will you join me in this? Lord, I just love this couple. I thank you for them. I, I pray blessing over Sean and Christina and their boys. I pray that this season would be such a powerful season of your presence that you would pour your spirit out upon them. Lord, you would give them radical rest, like deep soul rest that will just not only bring life, but life into the future. We're, we're asking that everything you have for them would, would occur. We honor them, we love them, we bless them, and we release them into the season. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Can we honor Pastor Sean and Christina? And um, if you get a chance after service, uh, come and give them a hug, and I'm going to hand it over to Trevor to lead us through some announcements. Awesome. Well, good morning. Good morning. My name is Trevor. I'm one of the associate pastors here at The Square. I want to welcome you to our services. If you are newer among us, we're honored that you'd be here. And uh, we're so honored that we actually put together a small gift for you that on your way out of service today, we'd love for you to stop off at the Connect table and pick it up. We're just honored, again, that we're, you're here. And there's actually uh, uh, one other thing we want to invite you to do is that there's a Connect card in, back of e in the back of each seat. And this is just our way of be being able to reach back out to you, answer questions, invite you to have a cup of coffee, and ultimately invite you to a once a month gathering called Intro to the Square, where you can discover more about who we are as a church and what we're about, where God's leading us as a church. You'll get to meet some leaders and, and all of that. So please fill that out and uh, we'll be reaching out to you this week. 
on the back side of that uh, Connect card is a place for next steps. If you're looking to make a step towards discipleship or community, we want to help you. We want to see you grow in Jesus, and we want you to uh, thrive in community within our church. And so you can take a look at the different options, or maybe you have other questions or other desires in your heart to participate in our church. Come talk to one of our, us, one of our leaders or pastors. We'd love to help you make that step. And you can drop those Connect, connect cards, Next Step cards in the giving basket as they go by and we will be following up. We also believe in tithing, giving, and contributing to the work of ministry and the mission of Jesus through the local church. And we're just grateful for the way you have worshiped Jesus through your generosity in our church. So we're grateful for that. And you can begin to prepare those tithes and offerings through the envelope there in front of you or uh, online. And again, we're super, super thankful. Um, uh, we have a few announcements. So for, for them, go ahead and watch the screen. Hey guys, I am Chase and I'm the youth pastor here at The Square and I have today's weekly highlights. First, we would love for you to join us tonight at 6 p.m. here in the sanctuary. We're gonna be praying and worshiping and seeking the Lord about next steps on our building. We would love to have you join us. Next, if you've heard about the School of the New Testament, I have taken s and and it was absolutely invaluable and we would love for you to participate. If you're interested, you can actually come to our next preview night, which is gonna be on Wednesday, April 24th, and they're gonna be talking about the book of Revelation. So definitely check it out. And if you have questions, you can reach out to Pastor Eliza. Next, we would love to have you join us in our prayer room. We meet Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays in the morning. And it's just a great time to come and rest and seek the Lord and pray and commune with Him. It's a great time. We would love to have you join us. Lastly, we have worship auditions coming up, and we're specifically looking for two things. If you are a drummer or a guitarist, two things that I am definitely not, we need your help. We would love to have you audition, and you can do so by reaching out to Pastor Lindsay. If you have any other questions, you can head to our website or social media page. And on your way out, if you have any additional questions, you can always stop by our Connect table. Now, please stand and greet a neighbor. Well, go ahead and grab your seats. Go ahead and grab your seats. Come on, it's so good to be with you. And uh, I'm so glad to be here, to be home. Um, I was gone and uh, I came back on Monday, but the previous week I was in Brazil. Um, and it was just a, such an incredible time and experience. And last Sunday, of course, Pastor Emily Simons taught. I don't know if she's in the room. She was here for a service, but we can honor her either way. It was amazing. Give it up for Emily. And um, it was just such an such a amazing foundation, even leading into what, uh, what I'm, I'm going to share with you this morning. And uh, again, I want to say thank you. It just to, to be, uh, I've never seen some of uh, what I was able to participate in in Brazil, uh, just a part of experiencing a genuine move of God. Uh, and uh, it, was, it was really, several years ago, my friend Teo, who pastors this church, Zion in Sao Paulo, it's one of those deep senses of like, oh, there are things that are happening that I feel like I need to go, I need to learn, I need to experience, I need to see. It was just this you know, conviction. It was not, I didn't really have... Um, explanation for it, but I knew it. And so when Teo asked me to come, I just knew immediately that this was an opportunity. And 
And I just want to tell you the clarity of some of the things that I experienced and saw, uh, things that I believe are part of our future. And, uh, and God, what God did was incredible. The second best thing was that every time somebody asked me if I'd been, they were taking me to eat, have you been to Brazil before? I, I would say no. And about the third time I realized what that meant was that we were going to go to Brazilian barbecue, which was uh, the greatest week of eating of my life. Um, I, I cannot tell you how much meat I ate. It was just like an unbelievable, I mean, every meal. Have you been to Brazil? And I knew. I was like, no. And um, Brazilian barbecue, here we went. So thank you again. Uh, and I just can't wait for all that God is doing here with us. And it, it was two Sundays ago, right before I left, that I shared with you this, that, that, that there was some unique uh, moments and decisions in front of us. We have been in uh, just this process as a church family around our future and around our building for some several months. And, and today, my heart is, is to invite you into this moment that we together... Uh, get to walk into our next steps in, in a scenario that really matters. And I'll tell you that the, the, the challenge of walking through uh, of the season is that it's been filled with so many steps of that required discernment and wisdom and uncertainty, and it's, it's been uh, a form of tension. And, and I have, uh, today, I, I really want to invite you into what I believe God is inviting us to do as a church family and what it looks like together to sit in that place of tension. And I, I don't know about you, um, but I hate tension. I think that's a shared human trait, right? Um, I, I mean, I literally, I, I hate tension so much. It, my, when I'm in any kind of like form of tension, I'll feel it in my body. Like I literally, and I remember the first season of married, my wife, who also hates tension, has the exact opposite reaction, which is mean she just runs and ignores it, right? And so when we, when we were in our first season of marriage, there was tension. Like two minutes after, I would be like, hey, we need to fix this. How do we fix this? Like I would, and Emily's like, go away and leave me alone. Right? It's just our, our it, was, it took us a, a little bit of time to, to work all the way through that. But there is, there is something that I believe that God has for us. And even in the practical, we are at a place as we've walked through this story and season, we've walked through it with the city, we've walked through it in fundraising, we've walked through it together, that we have uh, at the end of the month to make a significant decision. Uh, about now that our permits uh, have been approved and we've gone to the city um, to, to decide how we're going to move forward in the midst of where we're at financially as a church. And, um, and I want to tell you that one of the convictions that I have, and I really sense that God is, is inviting us into, is that he wants to bring clarity and a decision in the midst of the confusion. I do not believe that what's right for us as a church family is just to wait in this place of uncertainty and let it linger. I believe that God is leading us distinctly in this moment uh, to a place of a unified decision and peace in the midst of that unified decision. And if you're new with us this morning, I know this might be abnormal for us to just continually be talking, but th these, are, these are moments of, of who God is making us into as a church. And I've shared this with you out of, uh, uh, throughout this entire process, that what I believe is that God is far more concerned about building us than he is about building a building. And he's hiding himself in these practical processes of a building because he's trying to accomplish something in us. And in many ways, I believe that he has been leading us distinctly to this week because there's things he wants to do in us in this moment uh, to understand the fullness of what he's trying to accomplish, not just in the finishing of this building, but in the building of us as a church. And so today, I want to speak to you about this way forward. And, and as I prepared for today, I realized rather than trying to give a building update and then teaching, the, the truth is that they're so deeply integrated. I just want to invite you into what I, what I believe God is putting in front of us. And to do that, I want to tell you about our moment, our options, our direction, our plan, and, and ultimately that this invitation is not just practical, it's spiritual, and far more than it's practical, it's spiritual. And I believe, especially if you are new with us, that the church was created to be dependent on the Holy Spirit. And it doesn't mean we're not a church of wisdom, we're not a church of discernment, 
We're not a church of structure or strategy or leadership or plans. I believe all of those things matter, and I believe any healthy church is going to be filled with wisdom, plans, leaders, structure, strategy, because that's how God meets us and moves. But one of the great weaknesses, and I say this out of love, I, I am, a, I am ten, you know, 12-ish years in, like I am a proud Southerner. I, I, you know, I'm born on the West Coast. I know I took me, the adoption process took me a little bit, um, but like I'm, I'm home. This is my home. I love the South. I love Atlanta. I belong here. And this is, God has really shaped me. I, I genuinely love where I live and I love the people where I live and I love the culture where I live. But one of the things that I know, and you know this to be true as well, is that there is this weakness in the Southern culture that views church as an event rather than a family. And so we stand at a distance viewing ourselves as attenders of an organization rather than people who fully belong into a family of believers. And I believe God is after us, that he does not want our future to carry any of that DNA, that he is actually trying to reorder our loves, he's trying to recategorize our thinking, and he is moving us into a moment where the decisions that we have to make, we have to make together, because what he's trying to do is he's trying to unify us as a family, not as a group of people who show up at the same event. And this moment of tension, I believe really matters because I believe it's in the tension that he's doing the great work in our lives. And so we have to discern and move into what he's inviting us to move into. So as quick as I can, I wanna give us, so we're on the same page, these details in the practical and how they're inviting us into an understanding of who Jesus is. So let's just talk about our moment in a really practical way. These numbers are very accurate outside of like some, you know, few dollars and change. I, I figured it was just simpler to round them. Uh, but these are, these are very up-to-date, very accurate numbers. In our general fund, we have $500,000 as a church. In our building funds that we've set aside, we have $2,150,000. In remaining 2024 pledges, we have $525,000. In committed 2025 pledges, we have $800,000. So this is just a quick snapshot um, of, of where we will sit at a current moment. And when you look at what we're moving into with our building, our building cost is $5.7 million. When you subtract those three things about we'll all be able to be factored into our building of the building, you'll see that that remaining balance comes to that picture that I've been telling you about that we're sit at that place where there's a $500,000 gap between here and being able to move forward. And in that, that moves us to this moment where we, we have to make decisions and we have to be a people of wisdom and, but the greatest desire is that we would hear the Lord and trust and obey him, whatever it is that he would long for from us. And, you know, this is, for me, I can just tell you this, God has used this uh, in, in really transformative ways because I recognize it is an invitation to a weakness where I learn the strength of Jesus. And it isn't that I haven't had seasons or you haven't had seasons before where you recognize you have to learn how to, how to become weak, that Jesus would become strong. But for me, it's been those places where I, I become weak and then as quick as possible, I want to get right back to feeling strong. And I know that God is actually part of what he's doing is he's teaching me and us what a lifestyle of some permanent weakness looks like. What does it look like to be dependent on the Lord? so that his strength comes and moves. And in that, we just believe that God is actually trying through these practical situations to mature us as a church family. And so here are our options. They're, they're in many ways quite obvious, but these are, these are not just, uh, you know, I'm not just throwing these out to you as ideas. These have been processed, uh, prayed through, talked through church council, pastoral team, and we feel that in some way or form that where the Lord would lead us into any three of these, we, we feel peace about them. Uh, but the first would be simply that we would borrow more than we had planned. We borrow the remaining $500,000 and use 2025 pledges to pay that down. And so it would be a, a temporary borrowing higher than what we feel good about, trusting that those pledges will be able to offset it on the other side. And so there's, of course, there's, there's the, the opportunity to move forward immediately, meet our needs quicker, and be able to sustain what we believe God is leading us into in a more urgent way. And then the, the challenge of the, there's an element of risk, and we can't be naive to that. The second would be to wait 
until all of the fulfillment of pledges have come in that we don't start building until we have just simply the ability to borrow what we feel peace about. And I don't have the exact date, but that would probably be somewhere in spring 2025. And so that is the second option. The third would be uh, just feeling the sense of moving in towards a second invitation of generosity, both with us as a church family and an invitation uh, to other churches to come alongside and support where they would be willing. And so these we recognize are the three options that are in front of us. And so our direction in this um, is that we feel like this is a week God has asked us to set aside as a church family and allow his voice and wisdom and discernment for us together to make a decision. I wanna be clear. It's not that I don't feel capable of making what I believe to be the wisest decision. Um, it's that I, I don't believe that the wisest decision is something that I can make. I believe it's something only we can make. And I believe part of how God is trying to reimagine what it means to belong to a local church is that decisions that are typically placed on the few, he's inviting us to carry together. Because I belong to you and you belong to me. And by the way, whatever is our remaining balance belongs to you as much as it belongs to me. And whatever the faith is that God's asking us into, whether that's a contending faith or a patient faith, belongs to you as much as it belongs to me. We are in something together. And God is using this building that does not matter very much to him to teach us something about us that matters a great deal to him. And I want you to see that heart. So part of what we're doing is this week, we're going to take time where our options together and our desire is that we would come to a unified decision as a church family uh, by the beginning of May at the end of this week. And so in that, we're going to set aside time for a week of fasting and prayer and discernment. This week, I'm just setting aside my own personal life to, to, to spend a week fasting, waiting on the Lord, asking for his provision and his guidance and his wisdom. I'm believing not only for wisdom, but breakthrough. God is my provider and he's made promises that I am not discouraged about. I just don't know how we're supposed to trust him. I trust him. I'm just asking for what is the vehicle of trust that pleases him. And that's what we are contending for together. And in that, we're, we're doing an all-church of night prayer tonight at 6 p.m. I invite you to come to that where you can. We also have these weekly prayer times in our prayer room. And we're going to be able to share discernment and wisdom throughout the week. And you'll find we're going to put this out immediately today on social media and our email. We've created an online portal where anyone who's walking through this process with us can submit both questions and responses of what you discern. We want to hear from you. You can share those in person. You can share those tonight. You can share those throughout the week. But we also have created an online place where you go, hey, I was praying. And this is, this is what I really sense. This is what I feel. This is, you know, I was reading the Bible. This is the convictions I'm experiencing. I want to share those. I'm inviting you in because God is doing something in us as a church community. And there's a strengthening that he's doing inside of us. And so that leads us to our plan, right? Our, 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 all these kind of steps in our plan, as I've shared, is that we believe God is using this practical scenario for something deeper. And he's inviting us and understanding his heart of how he's building us as a church family. And in the practical, we are going to make a unified decision uh, together by the end of April and move this kind of situation out of uncertainty into peace. And whatever is the decision we believe God is asking us to carry and is inviting us into, we're just going to live in that and move forward because what God is after, in the practical, I can tell you, I do not want to have Sunday after Sunday where I'm giving you building updates. Um, I'm grateful for what God's doing in the midst of it, but, but I'm ready, I'm, I'm fully ready to run into the mission that God has for us. And I'm telling you this last week, what I saw in Brazil, I know is going to happen here. And there is, God is positioning us to be ready for his movement. So therefore, we discern that as we're trying to make wise decisions in the practical, the greater invitation is to the spiritual. And so I want to share with you what I believe is our spiritual way forward. And while I am aware that there's this situation, this communal situation of our building, which I feel much more than you do, I'm aware of that. I'm aware, I'm, aware, I'm fully aware of that. But yet there is a shared partnership in the midst of this. It's not just simply that I recognize we have this communal moment of pretty significant decisions of what we're gonna do with $500,000, pretty significant decisions. But that actually I'm learning that there are things that are happening 
in all of our lives. This is a season. This is part of what God does in church family. This is part of what we experience is I have never in the life of pastoring the square experienced as many people in our church who are walking through personal tension, who are walking through personal challenge, who are walking through personal uncertainty. And it's an amazing thing. And it's not amazing because it's incredibly difficult, but that, that you realize part of, is my microphone being weird? I think so. Do we need to switch it over? Let me switch it over. That did sound like a fart, didn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Listen. Why I, why, why I act like it didn't? I was like, I haven't, was that me? I have no idea. I mean, it wasn't. Was it my microphone? I just, uh, anyways, there we go. You know, spiritual warfare. Am I right? That's so funny. That would be awful. Um, it, was, it wasn't me. Um, because... So I, I want to tell you that, that God's at work. And I believe the invitation for us is, a, is also an invitation for us as individuals. And that God has us in a unique season. I believe there are unique things happening in your life that have nothing to do with the building. That you're going to start to see, I think, a picture of the moment we're in. And part of what we, we have to discern, I know I've spoken to these things before. But that we as a culture have given ourselves over for this deep desire of happiness. This is, in the ideology of the culture we live in, we are bent towards a pursuit of happiness. That, that we want, long to be happy. We long to find lives that fulfill us. And when we say fulfill us, we mean make us happy. That, that we, are, we are trying to move every situation in our life. And it, even our desires towards God is that God would move in our lives for situations and circumstances that would make us happy. And, and very practically, when you look at the sociology, when you look at um, the biology, the, 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 the kind of psychology of what actually results when you experience happiness in your life, it's actually a very simple equation. It's, it's this picture of when your circumstances and your desires come into alignment, you will embody a sense of happiness or joy or peace. This is what will happen. And you know what? That's awesome. I'm no enemy, man. I'm no enemy of happiness. I bless you that you will have moments in your life where your desires and your circumstances come into alignment. That's a beautiful thing. The problem is, is that we have to understand that we were not made for lives of pursuing happiness. We were made for lives of pursuing wholeness. And your life is far too important to live for something as cheap as happiness. It's not that I don't long to see God bless you with what will be experiential happiness. It's that I recognize that if you live for happiness, you will live a cheap life that cannot fulfill what God has placed in your life to do. Because every life of significance and every life that matters is a life that's going to choose suffering out of love. And so it is only people who are willing to move out of experiential happiness into costly suffering are the kind of people who are going to live whole lives and lives that matter, and lives of consequence. And we have to let Jesus do this deeper work where he teaches us not to be people who live for happiness, but to be people who allow him to lead us into wholeness. And I promise you, if you let Jesus lead you into holiness, which will include challenge, trials, and struggles, challenges, trials, and struggles, you will find a happiness and joy that is deeper than you could have understood or known. And this is what God is after. We, friends, we live with too cheap of a faith. And I, I believe that the father heart of God is jealous over our church. He loves our church. And what he's doing in this season is he's actually, as a father, inviting us into maturity because he loves us too much to leave us where we are. This isn't an invitation of rebuke or challenge. I believe this is an invitation of the father heart of God because good fathers lead their children into maturity. And this is what God is doing in us. And it's that tension, right? The storyline of Moses, of what God is doing here in us. Right? That Moses is leading the people of God in the promised land and uh, the people of God are not happy. They're frustrated. They're frustrated with Moses. They're frustrated with God. They're complaining quite a bit. And there's this moment where God and Moses are having this conversation. And in, in essence, he goes, hey, Moses, listen, I, I, I'm going to give you the promised land and I'm going to let Israel have the promised land and just go take it. But, but I'm, I'm, I'm done. I'm going to do something else. I, I'm out. Uh, but, but I'm going to keep my promise to you. you. You have the promised land, but I'm not going to go with you. And what is Moses' response? He says, no, Lord, no. There is no promised land without your presence. 
I would rather be in the desert with you than anywhere else without you. I will not go into the promised land without you because there's no promised land that you're not a part of. See, and this is what God was doing in the life of Moses in the midst of tension, in the midst of wandering, in the midst of trial and suffering. He was actually reordering his heart to love what mattered the most. And God is doing this in this moment, in this hour, through your personal life, through our shared collective life, because he's after a future where we would say, I love your presence more than anything else. Your presence is our promised land. I would rather stay in the desert. I would rather, this, the two Sundays ago in Brazil, there was eight Sunday services. And I literally told the Lord, Oh, I would rather do eight services in your presence. I would rather do anything you ask in your presence. I'd rather step down as a pastor in your presence. I'd rather lay down all of my dreams that I have. I, I have one dream, and it's to belong to you. I have one dream, and it's just to attach the fullness of my life to you. I want nothing else. I want you. And just even the pictures of the difference between Saul and David, you know, when, because the reality is when you look at these two kings, God picked both of them. By the way, Saul's sin, far less than David's. But what was the marker difference between Saul and David? When Saul's sin got exposed, he begged to the prophet, come and honor me in front of the people. What he didn't want to lose, because by the way, when you're caught in failure, you will always recognize what matters the most to you because you'll not want to lose it. But what did David say? Psalm 51. Don't take your spirit from me. Have it all. Take it all. Do not remove your spirit from me. Oh, guys, this is the invitation. God is forming in us how to be a people of his presence. And he's using tension and challenge to shape that in us. And James 1 gives us just this invitation and picture into what that looks like. And James 1 says, consider it pure joy my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance, so let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. I love this passage. I, my staff makes fun of me a lot because I'm a person of hyperbole. I think they've recorded nearly 60 verses where I've said, this is my favorite verse in the Bible, right? Um, and, uh, and that's not my view on this verse, but the, my view on this is, is that I think this is the most unbelieved verse in the Bible. And I can say that with confidence. I don't think I've ever said it about any other verse. This, this verse is the kind where you read it and you're like, mm, no, 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 thank you. No, I don't want it. And I don't think it's possible. And the longer you sit with it, the more it actually begins to frustrate you because you're like, no, no, James, you don't get to say stuff like this. Because e even if you do it right, even if you suffer willingly, even if you endure, even if you're faithful, even if you walk through challenges and you don't accuse the character of God, where is there joy in it? I, I admit, there's, even if you come to a place where like, I'm willing, but joy? Like, oh, James, come on, man. It's just like, you're just setting me up for a failure. You're setting me up for something I'll never fully be able to obtain, right? And you just feel this frustration. At least I did. But I, in this last five, six years, have begun to see the invitation that I believe that I could never see before. And part of it is, right, James is writing from a father's heart. He's writing to a people who are suffering and persecuted far more than we are experiencing in our lives. And he's writing to them and saying, hey, friends, I know it's hard right now. I know it's really hard right now. But I'm telling you that if you knew what God was doing and how hard it is, you'd find joy. And he begins to, to bring understanding into those circumstances. And I just even want to tell you, I believe this. God is, he is inviting us into a joy in the midst of trial and challenge because he wants, to, he wants to reestablish our understanding of who he is. Because think about what happens when we go through difficulties. It's like, I, I, would, I would honestly tell you, I think this is, the greatest lie that exists in the American church. And this is the most profound weakness we carry as a church. And I see it over and over again. And I know it in my own heart that when we walk through difficulties and challenges is what we do. Where are you, God? Feels like you're gone. 
feels like you're not faithful, feels like you haven't kept your promises. You say you love me, but then you walk, let me walk through these kind of circumstances. And when we get in the midst of trial, what happens is way too quickly, we come to the place of go, where are you? If, if you were faithful, you wouldn't let this happen. If you loved me, you wouldn't let this happen. And the challenges that we experience in our life so quickly make us move to a, an, an accusation of the character of God. But this is not what we see in the heart of the scriptures. I mean, think about how different we are from what you see. Acts chapter 5. We see the disciples have just become uh, the, the first churches in movement, and this is the first moment of persecution. And what it says in Acts chapter 5 is once they were released from jail after being beaten, persecuted, and jailed, they're walking out of, uh, out of jail back home, and they go, they worshiped and thanked God, and they said, could you believe it? That God considered us worthy of this. God, I can't believe you trust me with this, to suffer like Jesus suffered. Uh, Paul says in Philippians 3, I want to know Jesus in the heights of his resurrection and in the depths of his suffering. He's saying there, there is an intimacy with God in trial that I would rather know than just have a life of ease. When you actually look at the biblical story and invitation of, of what's happening, you, you begin to see this painful examination of how different we are. Friends, suffering and trial are not signs of the absence of God. They are invitations into the presence of God. The problem is, is that we have determined that pain is our enemy and therefore any pain we go through is unfair and we want to so quickly accuse God of his abandonment, not recognizing that God is doing something in the midst of trial that is actually for our good. This is what God is after in us. And this is what James says. He says, consider it joy when you face trials of any kind. That word, I really, I love it in the Greek because it, it, it can be translated as multiple kinds and types, manifold, multiple colors and expressions. And what it kind of means in its most literal idea is that trials of many kinds, many directions, many manners. It's, it's meant to be a word that feels like this. Have you ever been in seasons where it's not like you're walking through something hard, you have hardship going this way, this way, that way, that way, every direction. It's like a tornado of pain, right? Like you are in seasons where it is trial everywhere and everything. Everything's hard. Everything has confusion. Everything has difficulty. He's saying, friends, even in moments like this, you can consider it joy. How? Like, how? like that's what I say to James in pain and trial, moving every direction. How? And this is what he begins to help us understand. He goes, because when you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And what he's trying to say to us is that we have to understand that when trial is happening in our lives, something else is happening. And it's that something else that we diminish. And it's that something else that matters to God. And it's that something else that needs to matter to us. Because what James is saying is it's in trial. And by the way, when you do a biblical exegesis on this throughout the entire scriptures, you're going to find it is only in trial. It is only in challenge. It is only in suffering that this thing happens. You can't get it anywhere else. There's no Amazon link. There's no kickoff project. There's, there's nothing. You can only get this one thing, one place, and it is trusting God in suffering. And that one thing is what James says is perseverance. Or this Greek word, uh, hupomeneo. You can say it, hupomeneo. Uh, knowing that in the Greek doesn't matter at all. It's just a fun word to say. It's one of my favorite Greek words. God wants to give you hupomeneo. And this word that we translate as perseverance is this word that means this patient endurance that can resist the opposition it's facing. It can hold up under the weight that comes against it. So this is the picture. When you're in trial, God's working the night shift. When you're in trial, God is doing things you can't see. When you're in trial, your emotions might be feeling all of the context of, of hardship, but the spirit is doing a work beyond your imagination, and God is giving you hupomeneo, and this enduring, patient ability to stand up in trial and not let opposition knock you over. It's a strengthening. This is what James is saying. It's in your greatest trials that God is doing your greatest strengthening. And then he says, you have to let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So James is saying, as God is doing this work in trial, you have to understand something. You have a choice in it. 
And you're either going to decide to let perseverance finish its work, or you're going to make a decision to try to get out of this as much as possible. And this is the invitation that's in front of us. When you're in trial as a community, when you're in trial in your individual life, you only have two options. You're going to lean in or you're going to lean out. And part of what God is saying is this is a moment to lean in. Why? Because perseverance is a worker, and he's doing a work in you. And if you've ever driven past like half-built homes that, or half-built buildings and, and, the, and they started it and they couldn't finish it, now it just sits there and it stands and it, and it begins. I want to tell you that this is a picture of the church in our lives for way too often. God is not concerned about us building a half-built building in the practical. I think he is deeply concerned about us building a half-built building in us. Yeah. And he's trying to say there is a work that he's doing that you have to let come to its completion. You actually have to let perseverance do its work. And you know those two words, mature and complete, what's interesting is they basically mean the exact same thing, but they have a different nuance, which is why the translations do them as two different words, but they both just mean wholeness. They both mean wholeness. But the difference is this word that gets translated as mature is about a wholeness in you, and this word that gets translated as complete is about a wholeness in your purpose. See, and this is what God is doing, perseverance. It's making you whole. It's making you whole. It's making your purpose whole, the very plans of God. So this is what James is saying. The reason you can have joy in the midst of pain tornadoes is because it's in trial that God is giving you your future. You can literally begin to discern and understand, I am walking through such a difficult season, and then it hits you. Oh my goodness, God is bringing my future to me. He's actually leading me into the seasons I've been praying about, but this is what's true about God. He's a good father. And he's not going to lead you into seasons of your future that require you to have a strength that you don't currently have, that if God gave you your future, now it would just crush you. That's what bad fathers do. Bad fathers give their children whatever they want when they don't have the maturity to be able to handle it and they let them be crushed under the weight of it. But good fathers can look at their children and go, I am so ready for your future, but come on, we gotta get a little bit stronger. We gotta learn how to oppose a little bit more. We gotta learn how to resist a little bit more because the weight of your future, the significance of what I'm trying to lead you into is so important. You actually have to let your strength be developed so you can sustain it. That's what God is doing with us. He's actually right here, right now. This is not this, his, his delaying, his tarrying in the tension in our communal life, his tarrying in the tension in your personal life is not God abandoning you. It is actually the proactive work of God delivering his promises to you. But he's doing it in the midst of trial so he can bring you strength. And when you know that, that's real joy. That's real joy because it changes everything. Matt, you could come up. Because actually, and I do this now, I recognize that while I am walking through various trials of various kinds and various means, my God is being faithful to me. And I go, Jesus, okay. You think I'm ready? I don't feel ready. But come on, let's go get stronger together. Well, he doesn't need to get stronger. You know what I mean. Let's get me stronger together. And that's the vision. That's why you can have joy. Because trials are where God keeps his promises. Trials are where God brings you your future. Trials are the act of the faithfulness of God. And I know your emotions don't always feel it. But I'm telling you, it's what he does. And that's how Peter could come out of jail, whipped bloodied, bruised, and he could go, Jesus, I can't believe you trust me with this. Because he knew what suffering actually was. The lie we have believed is that suffering is when God leaves us. It's not true. And I do not minimize suffering. I just know the truth. Suffering is when God is nearest not when he is most abandoned. This is our moment. What God is doing is he's giving us some hupomaneo 
because he's looking at our future and saying, hey, it's time. The things I want to do in you and through you, it's time. So we got to learn to persevere a little bit more so that when they come, you can hold up under the weight of them. So like I said, what are our options? You either lean out or you lean in. So here's my super encouraging word for you as I am the most happy and encouraging pastor that's ever existed. It's time to lean into suffering. It's time to drop your accusations against the character of God. It really is. I, I wanna say this, this I, I, I love you. Man, I pray for you. And I have watched the scheme of the enemy break into so many people's lives. I was saying, God, you failed me. How can I trust you? I know those feelings. I've walked through them in my own story. It's deception. And I don't want you to live life deceived by what pain screams. And it's not that I dishonor pain. I just recognize what it is and what it isn't. So this is a moment for us to lean in and let God finish his work. And so what does that mean for this sense of direction? What does this mean for a sense of our plan and what Jesus is doing in us? There's a, a picture in the, in the book of Ezra that I'm gonna close on and, and pick up on next Sunday. But it's interesting, Ezra is a book that in this season, God has kind of led me through that has a lot of history in my own life of the way God has used it and, and spoken to me as a, as, a, as a direction of wisdom. Because interestingly enough, the book of Ezra is about the people of God rebuilding the temple that face opposition and challenge, get wearied and stop, and how God strengthens them to finish the temple. But in the end, what God was always after was the hearts of his people. And I'm like, oh, that feels like a story I'm in right now. And let me be clear, I do not, I would not and do not equate any church building, any project with the holiness of rebuilding the temple of God. I'm not foolish and I'm not naive. So I hold this at a reverent distance, but I cannot deny how God is using this book in a very unique way. And this moment happens in Ezra 4, 24, where the, the level of challenge coming against the people of God, they stop. But then Haggai, Haggai and Zechariah and, and Ezra 5, these two prophets come and they strengthen the people. And it's in that strengthening that they continue the work that is in front of them. And when you actually let Ezra, Ezra tells you about the strategies, by the way, this is, this, this is just like, a, it, this is what the Bible is for, it's timeless. And it teaches us timeless truths that we can carry in every season. Ezra's trying to equip the people of God to understand how the enemy comes against you when you're walking into your future and promises. Now, I'll, let me just throw these at you so you know Ezra 3, 1 through 3, the fear, uh, manipulation, discouragement, confusion, opposition, personal attack. And on the first one, I should say fear and intimidation. So if you want to know, when you start to take ground, this is what's going to come at you. Always, because it's when you start to take ground in your future that the enemy wants to come and rob the very work that God's doing. This is what the scriptures tell us. And Ezra is a gift to us because it helps us actually understand the strategies of what happens when, when, when the enemy begins to oppose the work of God in our lives. And can I tell you, in no season I have known, have I known as many people walking through fear, intimidation, manipulation, discouragement, confusion, opposition, and personal attack. Why? Because God is walking us into our future. He's walking you into your future. It has nothing to do with this building except that you are a part of this body and this body is a part of you and we belong together in ways we need to start believing and ways we need to start seeing because it's this invitation that helps us discern what is our direction, our direction is that God is going to, and we must allow him in the tension, in the difficulty, in the trial to come and bring us strength to persevere. And so in the practical, we are going to set aside this week to pray and fast and allow God to meet us. But in, it's here that we recognize the true direction. The true direction is God, finish your work. Give us the strength to endure 
that we could be faithful to finish the work you've given us, which is not a building, it's a mission. It's a people in a city to be saved and rescued and loved. It's lives to be made whole. It's children to be set free. It's, <laughs> I don't care about a building. I never have. I am longing for God's fulfillment of his promises of a city rescued. I don't want to pastor a church that's okay slowly growing and feeling really good about itself and our city going to hell. I'm after the move of God that rescues families. I'm after a move of God that touches cities. I've seen things I can't unsee. And I know what happens when there would be a people who would give themselves fully to God. He pours his spirit out and he moves and he saves and he rescues. That's what I want. And, and so this leads us to our plan, which will be what I invite you into next Sunday. But there's this moment in Ezra 5 where it talks about when they stopped the work, these prophets come and it just says that they strengthen them. But it doesn't tell us anything about what they say, but Haggai wrote a book about it, it's in the Bible. And you can go to Haggai 1 and 2 and he tells you what he says. And let me just warn you, it is an absolute rebuke. But when I read it, I, I just like, like my heart got gripped for what I think God's trying to say to us. Because in essence, this is what Haggai says. Isn't it interesting? The houses you live in. And while my house is in ruins, I know what you've given, but you haven't given one thing, which is your heart. So I will oppose you until you give the one thing. I read that. I didn't think about you. I didn't think about anyone. I thought about me. I just, <laughs> I just telling you my story. Emily and I gave generously. We felt like we, I believe this, the Lord spoke to us. We did what he asked. Joyfully, heart, heart, heartfully. I know that's not a word. We genuinely want to posture our lives in radical generosity. And then I heard this and I knew it was not about amounts for me or for anyone. <laughs> and God began to take me back to the missionary kid. When I lived in the hill tribes of Thailand, other seasons of my life, I had nothing I was possessionless, but I had a heart. And I had a heart that burned. And how easy it is through life, responsibility after responsibility, situation after situation. Next thing you know, you're pastoring a church and you have four kids and life is hard. And your story and your circumstances may differ, but they are equally as hard. And you just begin to manage life. You begin to manage your circumstances. You begin to manage your obedience. You begin to manage your generosity. You begin to manage everything. And there's this moment where God's like, I'm done with your management. No matter how generous it may look to anyone else, what I'm after is the one thing you haven't given. I want that heart. I was talking with God just two Sunday mornings ago. It was 6.30 a.m. Was, I was a mess. And I'm like, I don't know how to give you that heart, God. Because that heart didn't have children. That heart wasn't married. That heart didn't have responsibility. That heart didn't feel all the things I feel. That heart didn't have to do everything I have to do. And I don't think these things are bad, so I don't know what to do. And that's where he's like, that's it, Phil. You've created a world where you believe you have to do these things out of your strength, that you have never allowed me to do these things out of my strength. I'm telling you, you can be that 19-year-old kid that burned for me and in the Karen tribes and be a father and a pastor and a man with a ton of responsibility. You're just gonna have to trust me. But it's hard to be weak. 
and it's hard to stay weak. But this is what God's doing. And let me be clear. I recognize that my invitation and in all of this is gonna require trust because without it, it can feel incredibly self-serving. I just care about you. But what I want you to know that this is what I feel going into a week where I'm gonna invite you to come and pray. I'm gonna invite you to contend. I'm gonna invite you to carry some of this tension with you. I don't need you to be me. I don't need you to be in my role. But God is maturing our church family and I'm asking you to come and be a part of the body. If you can't come tonight, that's okay. But I'm this the posture of the heart this week and I can tell you what God's after. He wants your heart. He wants our heart. And he's trying to get our attention in the tension for what wasn't given, for what has been withheld. And let me be first in line to go. (laughs) Jesus, it's a lot easier to give you my money than it is to give you my heart. It's a lot easier to to trust you with outer decisions than to just say, I want out of the tension, God. I want out of the tension. But God is leading us to find him in the tension and to know him in ways we've never known him before. And so this is our plan. To just let this week be a week where we would let the Lord address our hearts. And wherever there needs to be repentance, come join me in my repentance, which has been very real. Guys, I love God. (laughs) I'm in such need of grace. It is easy in my life to follow him on the outside of me. And I love that my dad is jealous from my heart and will not lead me into a future that my heart can't hold. And what he's doing for me, he's doing for you. And he's inviting us all in. I have to let you go. Prayer teams, come forward. Let me pray. If you have questions, needs, practical, spiritual, reach out. As I said, we're gonna have that place for you to submit discernment and questions online. It's on our website. We'll find, you'll find it in our social media and our email later today. Come and join us this week in prayer at any time you can. God bless my church. Guide them, lead them, love them. We need you. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, may God bless you, keep you, guide you, lead you, and may you know everywhere you go, you are radically loved by Jesus. I love you, church. If we can pray, let us pray. If not, I'll see you soon. Chick, 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 chick.